The United States has approved two vaccines for emergency use. There are a whole set of additional candidates waiting in the wings for approval. On this episode of Shareable Science Beyond the Blog, we'll talk about some of the front runners. Welcome to Shareable Science. Science you can share. As of January 12th, about 9 million Americans have received at least one of the two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. So here's some context for what happens now. The U.S. has agreements with vaccine makers Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech to purchase 400 million doses uh, collectively of their approved vaccines. The delivery will spread out between now and the end of July. So 400 million doses, that equates to 200 million people receiving both shots. There are 330 plus million Americans, so this will cover a lot of us, but certainly not all of us. So we have to look to other vaccines that are also coming on the horizon. There are 10 vaccines that have been approved globally, two of them here in the United States, or they've also been approved for emergency use. And there are 83 vaccine candidates that are in some stage of clinical testing around the world, which is just amazing. It is the power of science and innovation. We're gonna talk about three candidates here in the United States that I think are likely to be the next set that we see cross the finish line and be given to the FDA for approval based on their results. The first is Johnson & Johnson. This is the name of their vaccine candidate. It's an adenovirus-based vaccine. So, some context. The two vaccines we currently have approved are mRNA-based vaccines. We've talked about that in other videos, how those work. An adenovirus vaccine is a little bit different. So, instead of using the instructions for the spike protein in RNA, it's actually encoded in DNA, and it's integrated in to the genetic information of a virus called an adenovirus. Adenoviruses cause the common cold, mild cold-like symptoms. And in this instance, it's been modified so that it can insert its DNA into a cell, but it can't make copies of itself and then go on to infect other cells. So it's a modified virus being used to insert a copy of the spike protein DNA to then create an immune response against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So phase three clinical trials for Johnson & Johnson are underway. In fact, the United States phase three clinical trial was fully enrolled in December at 45,000 individuals. So we'll wait a few more weeks until they've reached the number of cases that have developed COVID-19, and then they'll unblind the data and they'll determine how many of those cases were people that got the placebo and how many were people that got the vaccine. And then we'll see if the results are at a place where it's ready to go for approval. We expect to see that happening probably sometime in the month of January. If approved by the FDA, the United States has agreed to purchase 100 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Now, what's unique about this vaccine is that it only requires a single dose, unlike the two-dose uh, regimens that you see for the other vaccines. Now, Johnson & Johnson is also doing some clinical testing of two-dose systems, but we expect that the first data they'll report is on a single dose. The other thing that's different about this vaccine is that it can be stored long-term in the refrigerator. So it doesn't require the ultra-cold conditions that you see with our mRNA vaccines. The next vaccine candidate that we're looking at is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. You've heard me talk about this for months. This was one of the early front runners. It's also an adenovirus-based vaccine. It uses a different adenovirus than the Johnson & Johnson candidate. It's a two-dose system taken four weeks apart. It's already been approved in the United Kingdom, Mexico, India, and a few other countries based on the results of the clinical trials that they ran in those countries and presented to their authorizing bodies. That data, depending on the amount of vaccine in the first dose, showed an efficacy between 62% and 90%. 
The U.S. is in the middle of their own phase three clinical trial. That's the data that will be presented to the FDA. And we expect to see those results probably sometime in February. If successful, the U.S. has agreed to buy 300 million doses, and it also can be stored in the refrigerator. The third candidate on our list is the Novavax vaccine. It's different than the adenovirus base that I've already told you about. It actually is a protein-based vaccine. And so here's the way this works. They make the spike protein that's found on the outside of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in large amounts, and then they attach it to a nanoparticle. So this has a little bit of a resemblance to the structure of the coronavirus, but it really is just a tiny nanoparticle with a bunch of spike proteins. And then this, plus something called an immune primer or an adjuvant, is what goes into the vaccine. The immune primer actually serves to call the immune system to attention, to, to flag, to, to serve as a red flag, to then pay attention to the nanoparticle studded with the spike protein. This is actually the way that many of our existing vaccines have been made. So of all the different tools so far, this is actually the most traditional. Uh, it also is a two-dose vaccine with a three-week window between the two. And the US phase three trial opened last month. A phase three trial in the United Kingdom actually opened in September. And we expect any day now that those results will be made publicly available. But I think the US phase three trial is probably a little bit later this winter. 100 million doses will be purchased by the United States if this is approved. And it also can be stored in the refrigerator. So what excites me about what's on this whiteboard is that while we have great data and great efficacy from the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, we're gonna have a whole slate, I hope, of additional vaccines with slightly different characteristics, different storage conditions, different dosing, and potentially we may find that they work better in sub certain populations than others. So we'll give physicians and pharmacies a host of vaccine candidates from which to choose based on the need of the population. And this doesn't even begin to affect all of the different vaccines that are gonna be needed, not just in the United States, but really around the world. So these are the things that I think we're likely to see in the United States. These and others will probably be approved in other countries. I find this incredibly encouraging and I hope that you do as well. Please share this with people that you think would be interested in what's coming down the pike in terms of new vaccines. Thank you for watching Shareable Science Beyond the Blog, and I look forward to seeing you on our next episode. Take care.